Welcome to Link Rough Bible Church. Here at LBC, we are transformed by the gospel to be rooted in Christ, connected in community, and engaged in mission. My name is Chris, and I'm one of the pastors here. We are very glad that you have tuned in to our digital service. All of our services, whether digital or physically gathered, follow the same pattern where we retell God's story. We acknowledge that God is holy. We are sinners, Jesus saves us from our sins, and he gives us his spirit to accomplish his mission. We live sent. So I just want to highlight a couple of things uh, for you this morning. Number one, we have a business meeting today. So if you are a a member of our church on Sunday, May 17th at 11.15 a.m. this morning, we have a business meeting going on through the video platform called Zoom. And so you should have received some instructions about logging on to that. Um, And so please make it a point, if you are a member of this church, to be a part of that. There's important voting that needs to happen, both on the budget as well as uh, new church officers like elders and deacons and things like that. So please make that a point. Also, today, uh, from 1 to 3 p.m., here at the church, we have a drive-in food drive. I know that uh, some of you may be wondering, uh, because Governor Murphy has relaxed some of the restrictions, that uh, churches are now able to host drive-in services. Is that something that LBC is going to do? And the short answer is we don't know yet, um, because we just need some time to think through all the implications there. But we do have a drive-in service of sorts, our food drive, uh, today. And so uh, buy food, serve the community, drive in, drop it off. We'll have a couple of pickups uh, that you can just drop the stuff right in the bed there. And so from 1 to 3 p.m., pick up your food and bring it by the church, drop it off to support lunch break, which is giving many, many meals to those who need it uh, in this difficult time. Also, um, if you want to stay connected with us, one of the best ways is to sign up for our Three Things at LBC uh, weekly emails. So if you're watching this on the website, scroll all the way down to the bottom, and you can input your name and your email. Sign up there. We send out weekly informational emails about what's happening here at the church and other things going on, uh, usually Wednesday or Thursday, so you can sign up for that. But like I mentioned, all of our services begin with acknowledging that God is holy. And so we, we want to begin with Scripture, with a call to worship, an invitation to see God as he really is. So hear this from Galatians chapter 1. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins so that he might rescue us from this present evil age according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be the glory forevermore. Amen. Please join me in this prayer of confession. God of peace, forgive us for our anxiety-filled lives. Though our needs have always been met, we fear losing of what we already have, and we do not trust you to provide us with money, jobs, spouses, or other things that we need. Many of us are already anxious about tomorrow with its needs that we do not see. We live in constant fear that you do not really care for us and that our sin will cause you to abandon us. We are daily waiting for the bad news that will confirm our fears. A failed test, a lost job, betrayal by a friend, sickness, abandonment by a spouse, rebellion by a child. Instead of seeking first your kingdom and your righteousness, we have fixed our eyes on our own health, safety, comfort, and status. Yet you showed your deep love for us, Father, by sending your Son to earn your favor in our place. Jesus sought your kingdom and your righteousness above all things, even to the point of dying on the cross for the very sins that we confess to you today. You poured out your anger against our unbelief and sinfully anxious hearts upon Jesus so that we might receive a right relationship with you as a gift. You have adopted us as children, just as we are, broken, weary, and anxious because of his righteousness. For this, we are profoundly and eternally grateful. Amen. Hey, LBC. Uh, We're still longing to be together, uh, to join together in song. Um, But this week, uh, I wanted to... Uh, record a new song that just came out. Uh, It was written in the midst of this pandemic, uh, specifically 
to address what's happening in our world. Um, and so, uh, although we can't be together to learn it, uh, we wanted to introduce it to you guys this week because it is so relevant to what we're going through right now. Um, so please join and sing with us from your homes. Uh, and we long for the day we can join together again in this church uh, to sing together as one. Separation. The Apostle Paul was no stranger to being separated from the churches that he planted. In fact, that's the backdrop of the entire letter of 1 Thessalonians that we've been going through in our Sunday morning service. Um, and in fact, many of his letters, he, he experiences that same sense of separation. In the letter that he wrote to the Philippian church, he was in prison and separated from them. And so he wrote these words to them in Philippians chapter 1. For God is my witness, how greatly I long for you all with the affection of Jesus Christ. 
And this I pray, that your love may abound still more and more in knowledge and all discernment, that you may approve the things that are excellent, and that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Jesus Christ. Paul's heart was to be with the people of God and to encourage their faith and to spur them on toward love and good deeds. And in our current situation, we wrestle with that same sense of separation. And so our response, like Paul's, is to pray that we are united, to pray that we would be able to regather, and to pray that in our separation, that our faith and its outworking through love would flourish in spite of it. And so with this in mind, would you draw near with me to God as we pray? <clears throat> Father, we come to you again this morning in an uncertain time of separation. We don't know how long it will last, and we are feeling its effects growing in us. We are feeling impatient, frustrated, isolated. The fears and the doubts are emerging in our hearts. So we pray, guard us from these things. Enable us to continue to wait well by standing firm in our faith. Make us immovable in Jesus Christ. And so we ask that you would fill us powerfully with your spirit today. Allow us to know and experience the reality of your presence with us, especially as we gather online for worship. We know that apart from you, we can do nothing. And so by the power of your spirit in us, allow us to wait patiently, knowing that all things are in your hands and we can trust you with our souls. <clears throat> Teach us the depth of the riches of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And through the gospel, quiet our fears, ease our minds, stir our hearts to long for and to love well our brothers and sisters in the faith. Create in us hearts that love our neighbors. Create in us a desire to move boldly into their lives, to meet needs and to share Christ. And pray that we would bear much fruit in this work, especially in this season. But we long, <clears throat> we long to regather this morning and so we ask that you would move to bring that about quickly. And we thank you that things seem to be headed in that direction. And so we pray for our governing authorities that you have placed over us. We ask that you would give them wisdom to relax the restrictions in a safe and timely way. That you would grant them integrity to do this well and to do it with right motives. We pray for the leadership of this church, for the elders, the deacons, the staff, for the many ministry leaders who are laboring to love well in this situation. We pray for clarity in our thinking and wisdom to lead well in this time. Give us insight and guidance to make good decisions toward regathering safely and guard us from the schemes of the evil one who seeks to hinder us in this process, seeks to lead us astray and to divide us. In Christ, we know he is defeated and powerless, so give us eyes to see that we can overcome because Jesus has already overcome. We pray for our faith. We pray especially for those who are feeling most isolated, those who feel disconnected. I think of the elderly, the ill, the shut-ins, those who are struggling to stay rooted in Christ because they cannot or are not connecting with their church family. Guard them against the enemy who tempts us to stray, who entices us to walk after the world. Fill us with your spirit through whom we can remain united with you and with one another and teach us to love well. Make us aware of the needs around us, especially those whose faith is wavering, and move us to reach out and encourage them in their faith, to establish them firmly in the gospel, that they can stand rooted in Christ and immovable. And now, Lord, as Dan comes to preach, I pray you would fill him with your spirit as well. Give him clarity in his mind, sincerity in his heart. Give him power in his words. Speak through him this morning. We ask that you would open our hearts as we receive your word to allow it in, to allow it to have its way in us, transforming us into the very image of Jesus Christ. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. But now that Timothy has come to us from you and brought us good news of your faith and love and that you always have good remembrance of us, greatly desiring to see us as we also to see you. Therefore, brethren, in all our affliction and distress, we were comforted concerning you by your faith. For now we live if you stand fast in the Lord. For what thanks can we render to God for you, for all the joy with which we rejoice for your sake before our God? Night and day, praying exceedingly that we may see your face and perfect what is lacking in your faith. 
Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus Christ direct our way to you. And may the Lord make you increase and abound in love to one another and to all, just as we do to you. So that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. Good morning, LBC. It's good to be here to bring God's word to you. Before we get started, let me just pray for our time together. Father, I thank you uh, for this church. I thank you for each one who is sitting in their living room right now. I pray that you would bless them. I pray that their time together with me in your word this morning would be a blessing, that it would give life to them and it would cause their love uh, for you and for one another and for all people to increase and abound, that we might be fruitful and faithful. during uh, this particularly challenging season. So let us fix our eyes on Jesus this morning. Let us receive your word uh, with gratitude and uh, with uh, love for you. So Lord, we ask that you would be at work during this time. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, some of my best moments in high school football weren't the games and the championships that we won, uh, but it was the affirmation and love and encouragement that I got from my dad at the end of each game. At the end of each game, he would be waiting at the end of uh, the line as we walked off the field to greet me with a big hug and to tell me that he loved me and was proud of me. And it's interesting as I reflect on that experience of uh, how much more significant and meaningful that was, that that love and approval and encouragement that I got from my father uh, more than any championship that we ever won. And I think that that is interesting because I, I think it calls into question the things that we think are so important. Winning is important. Championships may be important. Success, however we define it, may be important. But if we don't have the love and approval of a parent, it can really drive us in a particularly negative way. Every child is really asking this question is, uh, am I loved and approved of by my parent? Have I been a good son or a good daughter? And if we aren't sure, it can drive us crazy. It can drive us to despair or it could drive us into some very unhealthy practices. Thankfully, the gospel is good news because in the gospel, we are told that through Christ, we can be adopted into a new family where we are given uh, and included uh, into the perfect relationship with a wonderful, loving, heavenly father. That regardless of what your human parents have said or uh, say of you, in Christ, you are more loved and accepted than you ever dared to hope. That in Christ, God the Father says over every single one of us, you are my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. And God's not pleased with us because of our performance, but ultimately because of the performance and the goodness of Jesus, his own son. And that goodness is credited to our account. And so God says over every single one of us who believe, you are my beloved son. I love you. I'm proud of you. We all long to hear those kind of words from a parent. We long for them to say, well done, son, or well done, daughter. And, and often, if we hear them, it can encourage us toward faithfulness in a profound way. And it's no different in the Christian life. Over the last several weeks, we've been looking at and exploring this concept of spiritual parenting as it's related to discipleship, because in many ways, Paul was a spiritual parent to the Thessalonian Christians. And as we've been looking through this letter, we've seen the way that Paul has modeled what it looks like to be a spiritual parent. He models what the love of the Heavenly Father looks like for those of us who are his children. And so Paul has been modeling that for us in the last couple of weeks. We've seen that through this letter, and we see it again this morning that Paul models what a good, faithful spiritual parent looks like. And this morning we'll see that spiritual parents speak words of life and they pray words of life. They speak words of life and they pray words of life. And, and so, of course, there's many dimensions to parenting, but in this text we see just another glimpse of what spiritual parenting looks like Um, And and we can get at that by asking these two basic questions. What do spiritual parents say and what do spiritual parents pray? What do they say and what do they pray? 
Sometimes in parenting uh, or in life, we just don't know what to say or what to pray for someone. And in this text, uh, even though we see our own weaknesses and inadequacies, even though we feel the weight of just not knowing what to say or knowing what to pray, Paul shows us or models for us what good, faithful, spiritual parents do uh, in what they say and in what they pray for their spiritual children. So let's look at the text. The first question about spiritual parenting is, is what do they say? What does Paul say to his spiritual children? Look with me at verse 6. But now that Timothy has come to us from you and has brought us good news of your faith and love and has reported that you always remember us kindly and long to see us as we long to see you. For this reason, brothers, in all our distress and affliction, we have been comforted about you through your own faith. For now we live, if you are standing fast in the Lord. For what thanksgiving can we return to God for you? For all of the joy we feel for your sake before our God, as we pray earnestly night and day that we may see you face to face and supply what is lacking in your faith. So if you remember last week, uh, Paul was expressing his, his deep anguish and his concern that they would not be moved by the afflictions that they were experiencing. He was concerned that perhaps Satan had tempted them and would draw them away in their labor in the Lord, in their lives, their investment in their lives would be in vain. And now Timothy, who had been sent to them, now comes back and he gives them good news. He gives them good news about their faith and love. In other words, that they are continuing to be faithful, that they had not been moved by these afflictions. And Paul takes great encouragement and comfort from that. And so the first thing he says to them, we see in verse 8, For now we live if you are standing fast in the Lord. He, he says, in other words, we live if you would live. If you haven't been moved, we live, we're alive. In other words, he, he literally uh, says, uh, or it means literally, now we can breathe again. Now we can take a sigh of relief. It's okay. We know you're okay, so we're okay. In other words, it's like Paul's been holding his breath this whole time out of loving concern for them. Uh, like the way that we feel when we're watching a tense scene in a movie, and uh, after it ends, we realize, like, oh, I've been holding my breath the whole time. I imagine that in many ways uh, that this was how my dad felt when he was watching uh, games on the edge of his seat as his, he was so invested in my life that uh, my perform and my performance that uh, he was on the edge of his seat holding his breath, as it were. Actually, I, I don't think he was holding his breath at all. I know he wasn't. He was yelling at the refs, um, and he was notorious for doing that. Uh, but uh, in a matter of speaking, uh, he was holding his breath in, in hopeful anticipation because his his life was connected to my life. And that's true for any spiritual parent, whether it's a, a piano recital or a speech that they're giving as parents. We, we sort of hold our breath in anticipation because we're so invested in the performance of our children. And this is the, the heart that Paul's expressing here. He's saying, look, our, our well-being is tied up with your well-being. If you're not doing well, I'm not doing well. Because the lives of parents, spiritual or physical, are inextricably tied up or linked together with their lives of their children. And rightly so, because when we're in Christ together, our lives, spiritually speaking, are linked together. And so emotionally speaking, we ought to feel the sort of things for our brothers and sisters in Christ, for our spiritual children, the way that Paul is expressing here about parenting. So notice that Paul's concern, though, isn't for their physical well-being. He wasn't relieved to know that they weren't suffering. They were. He was relieved to know that despite suffering, despite their suffering, they were still spiritually healthy, that they were standing fast in the Lord. Another way we might say it is that they were standing on their own two feet. My daughter, Sayla, is just trying to figure out the cruising thing right now and standing up, and she's super wobbly. She can't stand on her own because she's an infant. But Paul says, we're, we're grateful, we're relieved because you're not an infant. You're not wobbling. You're not vulnerable, but you're standing fast in the Lord. They had not been moved by the afflictions that they were experiencing. And this is what the heart of a spiritual parent is. And, and so, uh, pastorally speaking, I want to just keep putting this metaphor of spiritual parenting out, out there for you because that's the goal, right? The goal is maturity in Christ. And this is why Paul says to the, the Colossian believers that we want to present everyone. We make it our aim to present everyone mature in Christ. In other words, we want everyone to be spiritual parents. Disciples make disciples. They re reproduce their lives into the lives of spiritual 
spiritual children who can grow up to be able to make more disciples. That's the goal. And so we all ought to aspire to be spiritual parents, as it were, to be the kind of people who invest our lives or reproduce our lives in the lives of others, that they would be faithful followers of Jesus as well. That's what we're striving for. Spiritual parents invest their lives in the lives of others, and they feel what their children feel. In a very real way, we ought to, uh, it, we ought to feel the, the pain and the hardship. In, in other words, we ought to be so invested in the lives of other Christian believers and in their well-being that it actually scares us, that it grieves us, that it's like we're holding our breath. And when they succeed, when they're doing well, when they're faithful, it should be like we can breathe again. And that's what Paul is expressing here. The, the second thing that he's really saying to them is that we give thanks to God for you. Look at the next verse. For what thanksgiving can we return to God for you? For all of the joy we feel for your sake before our God. Paul says, I don't, I don't just share your life, but I also share your joy. One of my spiritual dads, because the cool thing in the, the kingdom of God is you can have more than one dad uh, or more than one mom. And so one of my spiritual dads, a, a mentor of mine, he used to say uh, when I shared a victory or a success or, or just something that God was teaching me, he would say, Dan, you make me smile. In other words, I'm proud of you in Christ. Uh, I am so grateful to God for how you're doing that you make me smile. And this is what Paul is saying is, we give thanks to God on your behalf. You make us feel joy. Your joy is our joy. And if that's how Paul feels as a spiritual parent for his spiritual children, how much more does our Heavenly Father feel that toward us in Christ? If the Father says of the Son, uh, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. If, if the look on God's face toward his own Son is a big smile because he's proud of his Son, then that's the look that he has towards you. A lot of people tend to think that, that God is disappointed with them because of their failures. But if you're a Christian, if you put your faith in Jesus and banked your confidence on his life for your life, then his life becomes your life. And so when God looks at you, he looks at you with a big smile, spiritually speaking. He looks at you and says, you are my son, you are my daughter, and I'm well pleased with you. I delight in you. And this is what Paul is saying to the Thessalonian believers. He's encouraging them to stay faithful. Encouragement is one of the best motivations for faithfulness. And so Paul is blessing them with these words of life. He's pumping them full of, of courage, right? Like encouragement means to, to put courage into someone, right? And so he's pumping them full of these words of life and these words of blessing. And he's saying, we're smiling at you. We're giving thanks to God for you. So keep at it. Stay faithful. And so I, I wonder, uh, can we be the kind of people who encourage one another with these sort of words to say, I'm giving thanks to God for you. I'm rejoicing with you. I'm sharing with your joy. But in order to do that, we have to be invested in one another's lives to the degree that we actually know what one another's joys are. We have to know what one another's successes, spiritually speaking, are so that we can rejoice and give thanks to God for one another. So Paul says, we get life from your life. We, we give thanks to God for you, and we also want more for you. We want more for you. We see that in, in verse 10 as he says, And we pray most earnestly night and day that we may see you face to face and supply what is lacking in regard to your faith. Now, now, Paul's not speaking of a particular deficiency, but he's speaking to the reality that there are still gaps in their, uh, in their following of Jesus. There, there are still more to obey because Jesus said that we are to make disciples and to teach them to observe all that I have commanded you. There's so many ways in which the Lordship of Christ still has yet to come to bear on our lives. And Paul says, as a good spiritual parent, you're doing great, but I see more for you. I want more for you. I don't want more from you, right? Like we say it all, all the time at a church. We, we don't want more from you. We want more for you, which is why we're continuing to invite you into more because we want more of Christ for you. And that's what Paul is saying to the Thessalonians. We see more for you. There's so much more for you to know and grow up into Christ. And so we want to get there to help fill in the gaps for you. Spiritual parents help fill in what is lacking for their spiritual children. In other words, they help them to become more like Jesus. 
A couple of years ago, there was a student who came to campus, um, and she was already, uh, in many respects, a spiritual rock star. Like, she was crushing it. She was serving in church. She was faithful. She read her Bible every day. She was committed to pray. She, she had a, a, a concern for, um, for, for, for people who were vulnerable and, and, and broken. She, she, she was thinking in that way. But when she came to campus, she really never had any significant experience in uh, evangelism, uh, in making disciples, in, in leading other Christians. And, uh, and so um, there were gaps in her life, spiritually speaking. She would, have, she would have looked fine, she would have been faithful, but spiritually speaking, she was, was still yet a young adult. And so, and so seeing that, I invited her into more. I recognized there's still gaps, there's still more for you to know, and, and gave her opportunity to begin to serve, coming alongside her like a spiritual parent and said, have you considered this? How about this person? What would that look like? And through that experience, she began to blossom in, in even greater ways than she already was. She began to grow up into greater maturity into Christ. She became instrumental in leading another student to faith, and she began to disciple some other college students. And she would still say today that I didn't know it at the time, but there were still gaps in my faith. And you helped me to see what those were so that I could grow up into greater maturity. And I, and I give thanks to God because of his work just to be able to play a small part in her life at that time to help her to grow up into maturity in Christ. That's what spiritual parents do. They help fill in the gaps and they release disciples to be disciple makers. And if we don't recognize or have someone point those out in our lives to help us follow Jesus, then rather than continuing to grow up into maturity in Christ, our growth gets stunted and we stagnate and have a stale faith and we stay in the same stage of maturity for the rest of our lives. And so as church leaders, we feel a bit the way that Paul does when we hear stories about how you are doing. Because our lives are linked with your lives. Our well-being is connected to your well-being. And so it's, it's a great joy when we hear uh, people saying things like, I've lost my job, but it's been so great because I uh, have so much more time now to spend with the Lord and God has been teaching me so much as I'm reading my Bible and engaging in prayer and in Bible study. When I hear things like that, it's like I can breathe again, like, ah, oh, sigh of relief, you're doing well. Or when I hear someone say, uh, man, it's been hard to work at home, but I have all of this extra time and I'm just grateful for, for this God-given opportunity to invest my life, my life in the life of my kids in a renewed way. And now I'm uh, teaching my kids and reading the Bible with them and praying with them in a way like I, I wasn't before and I give thanks to God for that. And, and I do too. I give thanks to God when I hear those sorts of stories of faithfulness because my life is linked with your life. That, that, that's the calling that God has, has given me and not just me, but the elders and pastors right? And so that's true for where we are, and we give thanks to God for us. But I also long to be with you so that I can continue to help to fill in the spiritual gaps and to supply what's lacking. We want to help you mature in Jesus. And so this is what, one thing I just want to encourage us all to be about as we think about what Paul is saying as a spiritual parent to his spiritual kids, to plead with us to be the kind of people who help others to follow Jesus. That's what discipling is. It's helping others follow Jesus. And so I want to encourage you to, to, to find one person that you can help fill in the gaps, that you can help grow up into maturity in Christ. And maybe, by God's grace, the Holy Spirit's putting someone on your mind right now. I want to encourage you to take a step and reach out to that person this week. To, to think through how, how can you help them grow up into maturity in Christ. And remembering that maturity is not about telling them all of the answers you know. It's about coming alongside them and helping them where they are to take the next step in following Jesus, helping them to imitate Christ. Every one of my four kids, by the way, four, four kids, I don't know if that joke will ever get old, um, you know, but I'm glad that there are people who love me enough to make fun of me um, and mock me and laugh at me and with me, with me, hopefully, not at me. Um, but I do have four kids, and the interesting thing about each of those four kids is that they're all at a different stage of maturity, right? They all need something different for each stage that they're in. And it is that same way, spiritually speaking. There are stages of maturity in Christ as well. And so we all need different things. For example, little baby Christians, infants, literally need to know what the boundaries are. You can go this far. You can't go this far. This is what God says. Do this. Don't do this. This is what the life of Jesus looks like. Spiritual children need a little bit more investment, and they need to be connected to God, to one another, and to their purpose in life. They need, they need to be shown that this is what it looks like to follow Jesus, and we're helping you to 
get there. Spiritual young adults, though, begin to think not just of themselves, but they begin to think of others. And so they need to be mentored and trained and equipped and uh, given opportunities to be able to serve and to leverage their gifts and callings uh, for others as they work towards the ultimate final stage of spiritual maturity, of spiritual parenting, where then you're released to make disciples. And so wherever someone is, if you're a spiritual parent, you want to be the kind of person who's helping per people in each stage move on towards greater Christ likeness. As spiritual parents, we fill in the gaps. We don't cause people to grow, but we facilitate growth by helping fill in what's lacking in regard to people's faith, helping people go deeper into the gospel, to go deeper into what it looks like to actually uh, apply Christ and his life in the areas where I work, live, and play. And so what might that look like for you? How might you help fill in the gaps for someone? Or maybe you recognize, I'm not a spiritual parent at all. I'm actually still a spiritual child. And maybe the best thing that you can do right now is ask someone that you trust from the church to say, where are my gaps? A lot of times we don't want to know the answer to that because it can be painful. But the best thing in order for us to grow is to invite that sort of feedback to say, what are the gaps you see in my life? Where are my blind spots? How do you see that I need to grow? And ask that person to help you to do it. So for you, it might look like making a phone call to someone this week or doing a socially distant visit if your conscience allows. And one thing I would encourage you to do is just take that study guide, the First Thessalonians study guide, print it out, take it with you, and just ask those questions. We're all in First Thessalonians together. We all are seeking to be faithful together. So help someone else follow Jesus and just talk about the word together. As pastors, we've been talking about the most important thing that we can do right now is draw near to the Lord and to do that together. There's a lot that's unknown. There's a lot that we're not sure about what to do, but God is here and he's here with us and he's inviting us into deeper relationship with him. And so we draw near to one another. We draw near to the Lord and we do that together. So take out the study guide, do that with someone, ask the questions, talk about the Lord and pray together. That's what it looks like to help someone follow Jesus. So peer, spiritual parents speak words of life. They speak words of blessing. Our lives are linked to you. We give thanks to God for you. We want more for you. But spiritual parents also pray for their spiritual children. And we see Paul turn his attention to pray for his spiritual children in verses 9 through 13. And so the second question we'll ask this morning is, what do spiritual parents pray? Maybe you've heard the expression, well, all we can do is pray. And when, when people say that, maybe you've said it, I've said it, when, when people say that, there's sort of a res resignation that I've done everything I can, now all the rest is up to God. It's kind of like the, the Hail Mary uh, pass or, or prayer where we're just throwing it up and saying, maybe God will do something with this. But the reality is, is that why spiritual parents know that that's not a cliche or a, a word of resignation, but why spiritual parents regularly say all we can do is pray because faithful and wise spiritual parents know that they have zero control over how their kids turn out. Now, of course, we can create an environment that would stimulate faithfulness, right? That, that's healthy and nurturing. Of course, we can do that. But at the end of the day, no matter what we do, we have no control over how our kids turn out. We, and that's true spiritually or physically. We have zero control. And why spiritual parents know that it is all the grace of God. And so spiritual parents who are faithful and wise are desperate people. They're people who are desperate to see God's work and God's grace in the lives of their spiritual children. And so they pray. And in that way, prayer really mirrors the gospel, doesn't it? It's an expression of dependence and helplessness, uh, of leaning in and trusting that apart from God's grace, I can't do anything. And so as spiritual parents, we pray our hearts out for our spiritual kids. Paul is separated by distance, and so as a faithful spiritual parent, he prays for our kids, and we should pay attention to what he prays, and also by inference, what he doesn't pray. Verse 11, Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus direct our way to you, and may the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all, as we do for you, so that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul's saying essentially this, look, we really want to get to you. We, we're asking and we're, we're turning our wish into a prayer that God would get us there. And we're going to trust that God can make a way when there seems to be no way. But we're also going to trust 
that God knows and does what's best. And so he, he prays trusting God's providence, but he prays specifically for them that their love would increase and abound for one another and for all people. And he prays that for that reason, to the end, that they would be faultless and blameless, that they would be holy in their devotion to the Lord because Jesus is coming back. And so he prays these things. And I think it's interesting that of all of the things he could pray for, this is what he does pray for. He prays that they would have big love for one another and big love for their neighbor, for the world. And the reason that he does this is because the mark of their holiness or, or the badge of their maturity in Christ, of their devotion to Christ, the evidence of what that is, is the extent of their love for one another and for the world. Not only that, but at the end of the day, Paul prays for this because that's all that's really going to matter. He wants to help fill in the gaps, but he knows that even more important than his coming to them to do that is that Jesus is coming again. And because Jesus is coming again, he prays for the only thing that's really going to matter. Jesus is coming again. He's going to establish his kingdom that's going to reign forever. He's coming with his saints. He's going to establish his kingdom here on the earth. He's, that's going to happen. And so Paul prays for the one thing that's going to last forever. Not their safety, not their physical well-being, not the avoidance of suffering, but for the growing and increasing, their growing and increasing love, because love will last forever. And I think it's interesting that during this time of lockdown, as we have been locked away, so to speak, from being able to be together and do church as we're typically used to doing it, that all that is left is simply the opportunity to be the church. All is stripped down. And so the thing that Paul prays, I think, is the thing that's most necessary for us as a church is to say, what does it look like for us to love one another and to love our neighbor? It's really that simple. Jesus said to his disciples, a new commandment I give to you, right? He's washing their feet. A new commandment I give to you that you are to love one another. Just as I have loved you, so also you are to love one another by this, by your love for one another, by this. All people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. And so at the end of the day, when Christ returns, our faithfulness as a church will be measured in large respect by the quality and the quantity of our love for each other and for our love for the world. So as I thought about that this week, I thought, man, that, that is so brilliant what Paul does in his prayer for a spiritual truth. Of all of the things he could pray, he prays for this, because no matter how faithful you are, no matter how well you're doing, spiritually speaking, there is always room to grow in your love for the family of God and for your neighbor. Because there are always still areas of our life where selfishness has its way. Because here's the truth, right? Love for other people is not natural. The natural thing is that we love ourselves. I'm naturally selfish. In fact, I have nine weeks now of quantifiable, verifiable evidence that I am a deeply selfish person. I naturally love myself. That's why Tim Keller says that the greatest enemy to your marriage is not any external circumstances, but it's your own selfishness. It's our own self-love that is the greatest obstacle to growth in our lives. The greatest problem in your life is always your sin. It's always your own selfishness. It's always that I want to be king of my own life and have my own way. And so there's always room to grow in love. Love may be the natural thing in my sinful condition. Love, or love for self is the natural thing in my sinful condition. But the inevitable outcome of being transformed by the gospel is love for others. Children are naturally self-centered. That's why we call toddlers me monsters, right? It's everything is about me. The world, they think, revolves around them because that's the level of their maturity. And my goal as a parent is to convince my kids that the world doesn't revolve around you, it revolves around me. Maybe at least that's how I act, what I display to them. But what I actually want to communicate to my kids is not that the world revolves around me, and it certainly doesn't revolve around them, but true love for one another, the, the, the true way to live and flourish is to love one another more than yourself, to give up your life for others, because that's what Christ has done for us. And so even as Christians saved by God's grace, we're still naturally selfish. And unless the love of Jesus takes hold deeply of our hearts, we'll continue to be selfish. We'll continue to think of ourselves first. We'll continue to love ourselves more than others. 
and will continue to be concerned about our own needs being met. But Paul, as a good spiritual parent, doesn't want his kids to stay in their state of immaturity, so he prays that their love would increase and abound. And the only way he knows, the only way that is going to happen is if God produces his love in us. And God produces his love in us by growing us in our awareness of our sin and in our awareness of his great love for us. It's hard to see our selfishness, but we ought to see, and we should be seeing, that we are more selfish and sinful than we ever want to admit. But the good news of the gospel is that in Christ, I am and can be more, excite, more uh, loved than I ever dared to hope. And so we only can begin to love one another when we begin to look more readily and consistently at Jesus. Robert Murray McShane, the old Puritan, said that for every one look at ourselves, we ought to take ten looks off and away to Christ. And so what we need to see if we are to increase in a love and abound for one another and for the world is to see how much Christ loved us, to see that Jesus laid down his life for us, that he died for us while we were still sinners. That's what God's love is, the way that God's love is demonstrated. And there is no greater love than this, Jesus says, than that one would lay down his life for his friends. The Apostle John in, in 1 John 3 says, by this we know love. This is what love looks like that he laid down his life for us. And so we also ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. But if anyone has a world's good and yet sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed or truth. I love that. But what he says is that we know what love is because Christ laid down his life for us. But the natural result of really knowing that, of believing that, that Christ laid down his life for us, is that we also lay down our lives for the brothers. And that's why Paul is such a great spiritual parent, because he prays for their love to increase and abound, knowing that their love can't increase and abound for others unless they are being changed by God's love for them in Christ. We don't naturally love others, and so apart from God causing our love to abound by causing us to become more aware of God's love for us in Christ, we will not grow up into faithfulness. We will not grow up into being the kind of church that impacts the world because of our increasing and abounding love. And so the only way we can become a more loving church is by drawing near to the one who first loved us. One of the, the things that I learned from my own mom was the benefit of praying scripture for your kids. She faithfully prayed actual uh, scripture verses for us as kids, and she would let us know what they are. And, and so I put that into practice in my own life. It's a great practice. Um, but one of the things that uh, I, I've been wondering as I've been considering this text this week is, what would happen what would it be like if we actually prayed these words, the words of Paul for the Thessalonians, for one another as a church? What if we prayed that God would increase, uh, cause our love to increase and abound for one another, it's the family of God, and for all people, the world around us? What would happen? I think that we're doing great as a church, but there's always room to grow. So I want to invite us to pray this together, to pray this for one another. And, and when I think about that, I, I think about, man, what could happen if we prayed that we would have an increasing and abounding love for one another? I think that one of the things that's so interesting right now is, right now we have no programs as a church. All that's left for this time and this season is people. There's no programs, there's only people left. We just have to be the church. And one of our core identities as a church is that we are family. And so as a result of the gospel, we ought to love one another like family. And so here's what I want to challenge you to think about. How can you love your brothers and sisters in Christ in this church family like their family? How can you and I lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters? I hear just such encouraging stories of, of church members who are writing handwritten letters to other members in the church and notes of encouragement or, or dropping groceries or, or just gifts off on their porch uh, or doing socially distanced and just stopping by in the driveway and just letting people know that, they, that they're loved and that they're praying for them or actually calling someone up on the phone. Man, like we asked you guys for each one to call one and every time I talk to someone, someone else has already talked to them. Each one is calling one, and praise God for that. That's how we encourage one another. That's how we draw near to the Lord together. We encourage one another, and we pray for one another, and we love one another as God has loved us. 
And so here's the, the, the challenge. Or maybe you're thinking, hey, no, one, no one's called me. No one's done any of that for me. Well, I, I, again, I want more for you, and I want to invite you into that. So, so be the kind of person who demonstrates out of response to God's love for you that same kind of love for others in the family of God. How can you lay down your life or your desires to have your needs met in order to love one another well? This is what Paul says maturity looks like, and this is what he's praying for the church, and this is what we're praying for you, that you would have an increasing and abounding love for one another. But he also prays that we'd have an increasing and abounding love for all people. And I think that's like way more challenging because our church family, there may be some people who are hard to love, but there's actually people that we like. But it's hard to love our neighbor, and sometimes we just don't know exactly how. But I think it's a good reminder that church, you, where you sit, like you are our evangelism program. We don't have an evangelistic outreach program. We have you. We have me. We are God's evangelism program. And God has placed us where he's placed us very purposely. We're not just family. Uh, the, the gospel doesn't just make us family, but it also makes us ambassadors. And the beauty of God's plan for the world is that he has made you his ambassador, and it's through you that he makes his appeal to the world to be reconciled to God. And so think about it. God has placed you very purposefully and intentionally in the family that you are, in the home that you're in. Wherever you sit right now, God has put you there. And he has put that home not just you in that home, but he's put that home in a particular community, in a neighborhood or apartment complex. He has put you there as an ambassador for him to speak words of life, pray words of life for your community, to show love for all people. And so what would that look like for you? What, God, what might God be challenging you or inviting you into? One, one thing you can do, all of us can do this. We're going for walks. Just walk through your neighborhood and pray for each house that you pass. Pray that God would bless that house. And if somebody walks out and says, what are you doing? Tell them that you're praying, that God would bless them and ask if you can be more specific. I think you would be shocked at the way that people might respond to that. Look for opportunities to love people around you. One of the things that I've been just encouraged about my kids being excited about is we have a neighbor across the street who's pretty elderly. Um, we met her Christmas caroling uh, this last year and uh, just have a heart to care for her. And, and so we saw her struggling down her stairs to get her newspaper each morning. And so now, uh, just as a small act of love and faithfulness, the kids run across the street and put the newspaper uh, in her mailbox so that she doesn't have to struggle down the stairs. Now, is that going to ultimately be the thing that leads her to come uh, to Christ? Probably not. But that is a, a small step of faithfulness to just simply love our, love our neighbor, to be faithful at that. I think another place that we consider how we need to love all people or how an increasing love might abound for all people is how we think about engaging online. And, and I I'm just I have to say that I've been kind of grieved recently by the things that I have seen or heard professing Christians uh, saying or doing online that oftentimes there's not much distinction between those who profess to be followers of Jesus and those who are in the world. And, and I think it's just good to be reminded that what we say, uh, we need to be so careful about what we're posting online. And is what we say uh, demonstrating the, the love of of Christ um, or is it demonstrating uh, the love of the world I think that sometimes we can be prone to think that the love the law of love and the Lordship of Christ don't apply to what we post online so be careful what we're posting or sharing online because we want to be the kind of people who are demonstrating the love of Christ not just in our engagement in our neighborhoods but in our engagement online as well let me close with sharing this story. I had a, a proud moment recently. I think the way that spiritual parents would feel uh, toward their kids. Uh, it was Emily's birthday recently, and uh, some of the church family uh, decided, and since they couldn't throw her a birthday party, they would throw her a birthday parade instead. And so uh, they got together and created a, a caravan of minivans and SUVs, and they let the kids lead the way down the neighborhood, and they created no small disturbance uh, in our neighborhood, honking horns, and then they parked their cars in front of our house. My neighbor think something crazy is happening there's people with party hats hanging out windows and yelling and signs and they're like what is going on like well these are my church friends uh, these are the people who've gotten together and 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 here's what I love about this one of our new neighbors uh, who we met um, saw this and uh, I, I got to tell them uh, not that these were people that I wanted nothing to do with, but these were actually uh, my church family. And so uh, this is the kind of people that my, the people in my church are. 
They're people who love one another lavishly. And so the first impression for my neighbors is not uh, what we're against and what our particular ideologies are with politics or, or our views about particular issues, but the kind of way that we love one another, that we have big love for one another as the family of God. And so I pray that we'd be the kind of people who disturb the world, disturb the brokenness, disturb the sense of peace, disturb the hopelessness that people in the world feel by our love for one another. And this is the kind of thing that Paul, as a spiritual parent, prays for them. And this is what we pray for you. And so if I can uh, make Paul's words my own for you, I would say this to you, church. LBC, you make me smile. You're doing great. I'm proud of you. Keep at it. I want to be with you. I want to supply what's lacking in your faith. But this is where the Lord has us, and so keep at it. And I pray for you that your love may abound and increase for one another and for all people, so that when Christ returns, you would be faultless and blameless before him. Let's pray. God, we love you. We thank you that you have loved us by sending your son. We pray that we would be the kind of people who love one another boldly, to love in this sort of a big way, and that we would be the kind of people who give words of life to one another and that pray words of life for one another. Make us that kind of people, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Sing, I cast my mind. I cast my mind to Calvary, where Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior on that cursed
We give praise to God for his word that it can encourage us and lift us up and strengthen us to persevere in our faith. We typically end our services with a benediction, which is a blessing for the road or a blessing for our homes right now. So hear this word from 2 Corinthians 13. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Live sent.